Well, good morning and happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day to my mom who watches online and to the mother of my three beautiful children. You know, the kids often ask, when is Kids Day, right? And the, the obvious response is, it's, it's every day. Turn with me in your Bibles to John chapter four. John chapter four, uh, we're gonna continue our walk through our sermon series that we've titled Misinformed. We've been looking at uh, the way our, our flesh, culture, and Satan attribute a false identity to us and that our one true identity is found in Jesus Christ, in him and him alone. So hold your spot there in John chapter four. So Jerry Maguire is the 1996 uh, movie of a sports agent who uh, becomes disgusted with himself in the industry because it's all about greed and materialism. So he listens to his conscience and he starts his own firm. He's gonna start his own firm and do it right. Put the client first. Now on his journey, Jerry falls in love with Renee Zellweger. I can't remember her name. She's a single mom um, who's nothing like all the other girls that she's dated because her life is messy. She's got a young son and her life is completely messy. And as the movie builds, like all romantic comedies, shocker, you realize that they are perfect for each other, but they don't yet quite see it. And into the dramatic final scene where Jerry bursts into her sister's house, it's a room full of women, and he begins the talk, the love speech that is going to woo her over. And he fumbles around, and in that fumbling, he ends with this statement, you complete me. And there it is. Hollywood magic, right? That dramatic scene will be reenacted in jest for decades, looking at someone and saying, you know what, you complete me. Now what's interesting about this movie, right, is that it has the same plot that hundreds of other movies have had, and that is that you won't find happiness in riches, in materialism, you won't find happiness there you will find happiness when you find that one true soulmate. Fulfillment comes when you find the one other person who completes you, right? Like a puzzle piece, you fit perfectly together and make the other person whole. If we tie it to where we were last week, this connection is your true authentic self. Right? And if you are married and it's a difficult situation, it's probably because he or she is not your soulmate. Okay? Because the right puzzle piece is supposed to fit easily, smooth. You just slide into one another. It's perfect. How many times have we seen that movie? Married the wrong person, but then I found my soulmate. Beloved, our culture is tragically misinformed. Here's the deal, you are incomplete, that much is true, okay? In fact, to deny that would be to deny the longing inside of you that is a result of the fall. But listen to me, Jesus is the only perfect peace that will fill you and make you whole. God sent his son because the hole inside of you is a God-shaped hole not man-shaped, no one else can complete you besides Jesus. And as we've said this entire series, Jesus not only came to save you, he also came to be your identity and to redefine you. And so this morning, what we're going to address is the dysfunction that occurs when our identity is found in other people and not Jesus Christ. And in our passage, John chapter four, 
we will see that Jesus intentionally seeks out a woman who is in complete dysfunction because her identity is in having a man. And in Jesus, not only does he seek her out, but I want you to listen for what he offers her. So listen, in John chapter four, I'm gonna pick up in verse five. So he came to a city of, uh, of Samaria called Sychar, near a parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. And Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, being wearied from his journey, was sitting thus by the well. And it was about the sixth hour, that's noon. There came a woman of Samaria to draw water. And Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Therefore the Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink since I am a Samaritan woman? For Jews had no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. She said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. The well is about 150 feet deep. Where then are you going to get this living water? You are not greater than our father Jacob, are you, who gave us the well and drank from it himself and his sons and his cattle. And then Jesus answered and said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I give him shall never thirst. But the water that I give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that, I, uh, uh, so that I will not be thirsty nor have to come all the way to draw water. And he said to her, go, call your husband and come here. The woman said, answered and said, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, you have correctly said, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one that you now have is not your husband. Thus you have said truly. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain. And you people say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship uh, what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. And the woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When that one comes, he will declare all things to us. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Will you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, as we come to your word this morning, is our deepest longing to hear your voice. In fact, Father, we welcome that your Holy Spirit would expose in our hearts the genuine questions and the thirst of our soul. Father, we pray that you would expose our misinformed identities, how we are clinging to other people to fill a void that only you can fill. Father, I pray that this message rings true And that the hope of the living water, the Son of God, would would absolutely captivate your people, quench our thirst, and allow us to walk out in a victory and a power unlike any other. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, the first thing I want us to notice about this text is the way that Jesus intentionally sought her. Let's begin with the root, okay? 
Um, Jesus is leaving Jerusalem and headed to the north to Galilee. Now, the most direct route is to go through Samaria. But the Jews hated the Samaritans so much, okay? They, they considered them uh, compromised in religious practice and in their bloodline that the Jews would most often take a much longer route and go around Samaria. They wouldn't even step foot. Not Jesus. Jesus intentionally goes through because as well, he's going to meet her. Secondly, notice that Jesus overcomes multiple barriers that, that, would, uh, that normal interaction would make impossible, but Jesus overcomes. Now, I've just mentioned that she's a Samaritan, okay? And in fact, this is the first barrier that she raises, okay? When he asks for a drink, he says, how is it that you, being a Jew, would ask me for a drink since I am a Samaritan? They are considered unclean to the Jews. And therefore, to drink from her vessel, that's shocking. She is a Samaritan. Jesus seeks her still. She is a woman. It is not polite for a man alone to address a woman alone. Even though it's in public, it is strongly discouraged in this culture. Jesus seeks her still. But furthermore, she is a sinner. As Jesus astonishingly reveals to us, okay, he knows that she has had five husbands and is now living with a man that is not her husband. In fact, this whopper of a fact reveals why she's there getting water alone in the heat of the day. Because she's been ostracized from the rest of the women in the village due to dramatically breaking her culture's sexual ethic, okay? The other women of the village, they want nothing to do with her. She is a Samaritan, she is a woman, and she is a highly dysfunctional sinner. And yet Jesus intentionally overcomes every obstacle and barrier to seek her. Thirdly, notice that the dialogue itself, Jesus actually says to her in verse 23, my father is seeking true worshipers, those who worship in spirit and truth. And now is that time. You see, his actions display it, but now he outright says it. Jesus has come as a spokesman for his father, and he is calling her. He is compelling her. My father is seeking true worshipers, and you could be one of those true worshipers. Friend, when you see how Jesus intentionally pursues a woman that is so confused in her sin and dysfunction that she is beyond her culture's norm. No one wants anything to do with her. When you see how Jesus overcomes obstacle after obstacle to intentionally pursue her, friend, what does that say to your heart this morning? Hey Amen, I pray that it screams that God the Father through the Spirit is saying, I will equally pursue you. That the Father is seeking those who will worship him in spirit and truth. Next, I want us to zero in on her sin. And for order us to understand that this comes out of a misplaced identity. We have to get this if we're going to understand why Jesus is offering her living water, okay? Unless you understand that, you will not, he is answering the question of her soul. Just like when Jesus encountered the rich young ruler, and as the dialogue builds, he looks and he says, listen, if you want to be complete, go sell all you possess then come and follow me. 
okay? How that just exposes his heart. So too here, right? The woman knows that Jesus is crossing barrier after barrier, right? Because she's a Samaritan and she's a woman. But there is this breakthrough moment in the dialogue where Jesus dramatically reveals, I know that you've had five husbands and are now living with a man, okay? It's this dramatic exposing. Listen, if someone came into my office, and as a pastor, I do a bit of counseling, and through our discussion, I uncovered that she had been married five times and was currently sleeping with someone that was not her husband. This is in 2024. Is that going to strike me as an area that we need to dive further into? You think so? I mean, you bet, right? Sirens are going off. How much more is that dysfunctional in Jesus' day? This is shocking level of dysfunction. Now, how good of a biblical counselor would I be if I simply said, five husbands, and now you're sleeping with a guy? Good grief. Don't you know how sinful you are? Just stop it. Would that be very good biblical counseling? No, actually, I think that would be pretty awful. Because what is obvious is that there are deeper questions of the heart that is driving her to man after man after man. Because no one gets married with the intention of it ending in divorce. Every bride is hope-filled that this is my forever mate. This man completes me. Our puzzle pieces fit. They make me whole. And in all of her dysfunction and searching, she's never satisfied. Right? She is tragically misinformed because her identity is in other people. Now, for our series, as we've been walking through misinformed identity, this is the moment now where we camp out and I step on every one of our toes. Here is the statement, right? My life only has meaning if you fill in the blank, if they approve of me, right? Our aim has been to expose the lies of the flesh and the culture and the way that Satan uses those to misplace our identity, to put it in all the wrong places, anywhere besides Jesus. And this one, again, I'm going to personally confess to you, is one that I've greatly struggled with my whole life. So let me just ask you, am I alone in this? Does anyone else struggle with finding their identity in other people or in other people's approval? Now, so far, all I've suggested is that finding your identity in your spouse or your significant other, that you complete me. But trust me, when that fails, countless parents idolize their children. They lose all sense of who they are outside of their children. And they sacrifice their marriage on the altar of putting their kids first. I have a few questions to ask you. Do you compromise God's values because you want your kids to fit in? You care so much about your kids being popular that you compromise God's values? Well, then you might be finding your identity in your kids. Do you ignore or do you justify your child's sin? And instead of correcting them, do you often blame others instead of having your child take their part? Right? Do you struggle with discipline when your kid comes home and tells you what happened at school because there's a note? Is it always the teacher's fault or something some other kid did? 
you might be finding your identity in your kids. Do you shield your children from natural consequences? Do you do things for them, like their homework? Because they plead with you with emotion, I'm going to get a bad grade, and then you do it all for them. You might be finding your identity in your kids. Are your priorities all mixed up because the children get it all? Do you forego your walk with the Lord? Or have you placed your kids above your spouse? Do you love them more than you love your heavenly father? See, you might be finding your identity in your kids. But a misinformed identity doesn't have to just be spouse or children. It can also be friends and groups of friends, people that you find influential. Those who allow others to define their their self-worth are addicted to approval, always trying to impress, feeling like they're, in their life they're just a dancing monkey for others, tossed by the wind of what other people think of you and say of you, endlessly anxious over rejection. I wonder what they think of me, overanalyzing every conversation. Did I say it just right? When someone else defines you instead of God, you sacrifice godly priorities, right? There's God, then there's our spouse, then there's our children, then there's our friends and others, and work is in there. And all of these are good things that God has created. But when that good thing becomes a God thing and begins to move up that ladder in its improper spot, suddenly you allow it to have authority over you. So ask yourself, are your priorities out of sorts because you're seeking someone else's approval? When someone else defines you instead of God, you endlessly compromise God's truth for approval. You see, you lack courage. Galatians 1.10, Paul says, For am I now seeking the favor of men or of God? Am I striving to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a bondservant of Jesus Christ. So get honest with yourself. Do you compromise the truth because you care more about their approval than God's approval? Do you fear men more than you fear God? Now back to our passage. Because what we see here is a woman who has endlessly compromised God's truth for the approval of man after man. And guess what? It left her soul thirsty. Right, it never satisfied. It always began hopeful, right? This is it, this is the one. But after it ran its cycle, it never completed her. He was never enough, or she was never enough. And her soul has become a parched desert longing for the rain. And what does Jesus offer her? Living water. Water for her soul. A well that springs up unto eternal life. And who is that water? Jesus himself. So think about this. This is our scene. Jesus intentionally goes to Samaria, sits down at a well because he has a God appointment. He intentionally seeks out and then crosses barrier after barrier to meet with a woman who is a seriously dysfunctional sinner. 
And her sin of endlessly chasing the approval of man after man has left her soul dying of thirst. And then Jesus looks at her and says to her, I'm offering you living water. My Father is seeking true worshipers, and you can be one of those true worshipers who worship in spirit and in truth. And Jesus is the living water. He is the truth. And those who come to him will be indwelt with his Holy Spirit. So friend, I ask you, is that you this morning? Because hear the words of Jesus. He is calling you to eternal life. To eternal life. Beloved, hear me say it again and again and again. Jesus, yes, he came to forgive your sins. But he equally came to give you life. To redeem what Adam lost. That he is your identity. He completes you where no one else can. For you could have the approval of the whole world and still be thirsty in your soul. But if you have the approval of Jesus, though the whole world be against you, he is enough. Church family, do you believe that this morning? And not only are you believing it, are you standing upon it? My oldest son, Ian, has begun power washing, going through the neighborhoods. He, he worked out a, a deal with his grandmother to borrow her power washer, and he began, and, and people love seeing a 14-year-old carry around a power washer to try and, and earn a little money. And so he's, he's gotten a number of jobs, and he started with this electric power washer, and, and it is taking him some time. And then we learned a little bit about power washers, and a buddy of mine offered his gas-powered power washer, okay? It is three times the power, three times the volume of water. You got to watch out. It's going to break up concrete. It's so strong. And so we asked if we could borrow it so he could kind of see if it makes his jobs go faster, and he said yes. And so we got this gas, very powerful power washer, and on it, it has a list of instructions. Everything must be done in this order. This order is paramount. If you do not do things in this order, you will burn up the pump, okay? Okay. Here is, here is a power, it's powerful, but if you do things in the wrong order, it is destructive in its power. Listen to me. Beloved, Jesus is your identity, okay? He is the relationship that makes every other relationship fall into alignment. And actually, friend, it creates power in your life. But when you do not do things in this order, it is a destructive force. So when you need your spouse to do for you what only Jesus can do for you, you become excessively needy. Your spouse cannot provide the acceptance, the security, the deep love that you need. Only Jesus can. And if you're trying to get that from your spouse, it is suffocating when you demand that of them. And when you need your children to do for you what only Jesus can do for you, you become controlling. Your children cannot provide the purpose, the value and worth that your heart longs for. Only Jesus can. And it is stifling to your children when you demand that of them. But when you are trusting Jesus to provide what only he can, when you, everything becomes ordered and there is transforming power in your life. All right, so in our text, you can see it if you look close. After talking with Jesus, our woman now has purpose. 
And she goes back to her village and she begins to tell all of them about Jesus. And when our scene comes to an end, the one who was formerly ostracized, right? They wouldn't listen to her. They wouldn't associate with her at all. Is now the key to bringing her entire village to Jesus. But let me show you in the Bible where it is much more obvious. The book of Ephesians has been our chief text whenever it comes to finding your identity in Christ. That's where we began our series. So when you get to chapters 5 and 6 of the book of Ephesians, now this is in the instruction part. The first three chapters are all about Jesus has come to be your identity. And then beginning in chapter 4, you get the overflow of now do this. Well, by the time you get to 5 and 6, you get extensive instructions for marriage and parenting. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loves the church. Wives, submit to your husbands. Children, obey your parents. Parents, discipline your children, but do not exacerbate them. Now, listen to me carefully. There is a key that is here. A shift has occurred. You might not notice it, But it is so powerful. Here it is. Now that your identity is in Christ, in all of your relationships, you are giving, not taking. Because Christ has filled the deepest longings of your heart. You no longer have to burn up that pump engine trying to get something from them that they can't give. Instead, you become the giver, and it gives life. Husbands love as Christ loved. How can you do that? Only because Christ is your power source. Now you can love. Wives, honor as unto the Lord. Children, obey in the Lord. Parents, discipline and instruct in the Lord. You are now free to be a life giver because the resources come from Jesus himself and they overflow to the people around you and you do not have to take. Guys, this is the power source for marriage. She doesn't complete me, Jesus does. And Jesus frees me to love her regardless of how she responds to me. And I don't need my children's approval, and I don't need to be their friend. I can actually love them through discipline and instruction in the Lord. Now, church, I told you uh, at the beginning of the sermon that I have personally struggled in this area. Right through the whole series, I've, I've told you about my misplaced identities, Recall that when I walked away from soccer, my identity as an athlete, right, I am what I achieve, okay, I walked away. But that identity has to find itself somewhere else. So that soon became a young lady. But before long, the you complete me, it was a smothering weight that she couldn't handle. And she walked away. And I was tossed around in the waves of the ocean, desperate, clinging to any life raft that would come along. And then one day, the Spirit of God rescued my soul. And he picked me up out of those storms and the waves, and he placed me upon the rock of Jesus Christ. And I realized that my identity is secure in him. And that foundation source has become my power source for everything that I am as a husband, as a parent, as a friend, and as a minister before you. So if you find that there is anything good in me, hear me, it is because it is Christ in me. 
If you find that I am any example as a husband, it is because of Christ. Any good in me as a parent, it is because of Christ. Anything that you see in me pouring out as a minister, beloved, it is because of Christ. And he offers the same to each and every one of you. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we bow before you right now in Jesus' name. God, I know all across this room, God, I know how we struggle finding our identity in all the wrong spots. But you, King Jesus, have come to give us living water for our soul. And you satisfy. You satisfy. Heavenly Father, I pray right now, men and women, young and old, would be crying out in faith, saying, Jesus, you are my living water. I need it. I repent of my sins. I need you. Father, I pray the believers in this room would reassess their priorities. They would know again with certainty that their identity is in you. We pray all of this in Jesus' name, amen.